What's up, Lions? For as little as $5 a month, you can help this show to grow while also getting access to our exclusive Pride content, which includes shows like Conspiracy Corner, Degenerate Gamblers, Special Interviews, Lions of Liberty Roundtables, and much, much more. So check that out. Help us grow at lionsofliberty.com forward slash support. Welcome to Electric Liberty Land here on the Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty with your host, Brian McWilliams. All right, welcome everybody to Electric Liberty Land, episode 70. Of course, you can find the show notes for today's show at lionsofliberty.com forward slash ELL70. As always, I'm your host, Brian McWilliams, and I have a very special guest today. I uh, consider her a friend, fellow comedian of mine, and uh, one of my favorite Twitter feeds to follow. But you may have heard of her, you may not, but uh, let me introduce to you a writer for Playboy, a sex columnist, actually, for Playboy, a contributor to The Federalist, and a writer for Mel, which is uh, a, a really interesting publication that that I guess is the vertical for the men's uh, shave club. But goddamn, it is, it's got some great content. But anyway, allow me to bring her in, Bridget Fetessy. How does it hang, Bridget? <laughs> it's hanging. I feel like I'm on a podcast tour today. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. You just came for what? Doing the Daily Wire, I think? I still have makeup. I feel like we should have really done this in, in person. <laughs> I know. Well, hey, you know, if our listeners out We need out video. There, yeah, I know. Well, hey, we're working on it. Don't you worry. Especially when it's like, if it's just me, I feel like people don't need to see the video. But if it's True. like me and somebody else, maybe then. And, you know, and Bridget, if you haven't seen her, uh, very uh, attractive lady. Probably didn't oh, hurt with getting you. a sex columnist position, being uh, somewhat attractive. It's like you're Dr. Ruthing it over there, where you're just like, <laughs> I mean, look, if I can have Dr. Ruth's career, at least she makes money. <laughs> True that. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me tell you a little bit about, uh, well, actually, I, let me ask you this, Bridget, because I want our audience to, to get to know you. So, you know, we were talking a little bit about the, in the preamble to the show, but, I wanted to find out about your political viewpoint because one of the reasons I wanted to have you on on this show was because your Twitter feed is blowing up. <laughs> it's bananas. It, it is bananas. Yeah, but it's it, but it's awesome because you know I I wasn't sure if what you considered yourself because looking at the feed, you know, there's you clearly you appeal to both sides and you take a very fair viewpoint in my opinion. So tell me a little bit about you, uh, your views, and then we can get into uh, you know your Twitter feed and. And this Tucker Carlson thing, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> um, so I would say that uh, I was pretty much just a, a I, I come from the East Coast and I was really just a a Democrat, raised, born and raised a blue blood Democrat. My we're we're dad, in the East Coast real quick. We're in the East Coast. Um, Rhode Island is okay. where my family is. So my, my family, my father is one of 10. They sang for the Kennedys. They were kind of like the <laughs> Irish Von Trapp family singers. <laughs> and it was just, I took it for granted, I guess, all of it. The whole, I just always thought politics were for rich people. So mm. I just, I was always a waitress and well, really, struggling. They, are. <laughs> they really are. Let's be real. Yeah. Um, so I never paid too much attention and just kind of voted Democrat because that's what I did. And then, um, through most of the Bush administration, I was drunk and didn't really <laughs> care or pay attention. And again, I was like, I didn't think it really had much to do with me. And then I, um, this past election, what happened was I noticed that I started to censor myself mm -hmm. online and around my peers in particular and our comedy community. And that was kind of the first red flag to me mm. that something was amiss. And then when I did start speaking out and speaking my opinion or even being remotely critical of what I now call the approved message, but at the time I just didn't know what I was up against, uh, I would be silenced or it wasn't even worth it. It was just shut down and, uh, it's like a, attacked, you know, like, yeah, like, like viciously attacked. Word. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's exactly. I mean, 
I, I think a lot of people out there uh, listening can sympathize with what you're talking about. And I, and I don't I want to let you continue, but yeah, I mean, it's it's shocking how quickly people turn on you, especially people that you know and so, have known for years will just immediately turn on you and and attack you with teeth and fangs bared for a, having an opinion that doesn't directly coincide with theirs. I can't tell you how many people on the left, in particular, big blue checked producers of shows that are political have unfollowed me because of my opinions. And I've had editors tell me that I'm alt right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, basically, if you are Michael, no, I was on Michael, the Michael Knowles show earlier at the Daily Wire. And we were joking before his show that if you're left of Hillary, you're basically alt right. Oh, yeah. Like any, anyone left of Hillary. Yeah. Well, and it's like you look at the Southern Poverty Law Center. I mean, they're cl- they're clearly a little bit different, but the uh, the people that they add on to like their hate group list now, some of them you just look at it and you go, what? Like the, it's like shocking the people that get added on to your like yeah these like slap with these labels. It's become, I mean, conservative is literally become like a slander, and alt right is uh, with definitive slander, I, I guess if you will. But yeah, it's like they throw it at people, and we've also been accused, by the way, of being an alt-right uh podcast and i and this we were accused of being alt-right by the libertarian national chairman because we had uh attacked him for basically turning away uh ron paul from speaking at the Uh, convention so he called he called us alt-right as a slur as a slur to try to get other libertarians to turn on us (laughs) oh gosh it's it's ugly the discourse is definitely ugly it's it's devolved completely and so I started, I, I, I honestly don't really, I've written about this and I've never published it anywhere. And I know that my, one of the top searches that comes up for me now is Bridget Fetisee conservative. I, I think people are trying to figure out where I stand, yeah. but I'm an independent. I really am just at this point now. And I registered as an independent. I, after years of being a registered Democrat, which I think but d- there are a lot of people like me who have, and I believe this on the right as well. And and there are a lot of Republicans who have come to the center because they've been pushed for one reason or another. Mm-hmm. But I think that it's, it's not, it doesn't bode well for Democrats to lose somebody like me. And it wasn't that they, I didn't really change mm-hmm. anything. I, I was, it, it's just that you're not allowed to be critical of any of the approved message and they've gone so far left that I can't, I I'm going to be critical of some of those it's extremism and you have to be critical of extremism on, on either side. That's our job as an electorate is to try and be. And I do feel that basically what I realized in this, my whole evolution throughout the election was that I had abandoned my civil duty, which was to be an informed voter. And I wasn't informed. I was really just towing a family party line. And I went home and one of my family members said that they were voting for Trump. And I remember it shocked me. But it also, this is a good person, not a racist, not a misogynist. And I was like, oh, we're missing. There's, we're missing something in the bubble. Yeah. And I mean, I always kind of knew he was going to win. And I used to joke about it on Twitter all the time that Kim Kardashian made $75 million <laughs> and Trump is going to win. <laughs> so then I, but then as I kind of came out over the course of the year, <laughs> right. which sounds ridiculous, but you kind of have to come out as somebody that's not just regurgitating the, the like talking point. I, by the way, I didn't know this, this was, it was this recent that you, uh, that you emerged from your chrysalis, uh, I would guess of thought. Yeah, it was, it was, it was over the course of, I mean, I was out of America for two years. I just, I honestly didn't, it wasn't that I didn't care. I didn't, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. And, and I just, I always paid attention, but I never engaged in politics. I just never felt smart enough, but that all changed over the election. <laughs> too. I was like, well, if this idiot can become president, then yeah. pretty sure. Well, not only that, but you look at like all the opinions of people that are just based, you know, you're talking about like in a way you had an advantage being out of the country and coming back and being exposed to it. I was reading, um, I think it was a reaction piece because, uh, Bridget also has a, a Patreon where she writes blogs and I've linked to that in the show notes as well. But I think it was your reaction piece to what the topic we're going to talk about in a minute with this Tucker Carlson thing, but talking about the boiled frog, you know, the old, 
the old tale of the boiled frog that slowly dies because it doesn't realize it's being cooked. And Mm -hmm. I think most people, when we talk about political thinking and being ignorant or being within these bubbles, it's like they didn't realize just how far they were being pushed or just how insidiously the communications they're reading have been changing or that, you know, we talk about Facebook and and, uh, the algorithms they're in or Google and the algorithms they have where you're only being fed one perspective. So while you right. think that you're sitting in the middle and you've got a, a clear view of, uh, of what's going on and that your rationale is on point, when, you, when you're completely blinded to the, to the facts because you're being fed this one viewpoint, you have that boiling frog syndrome. And uh, it's so hard for people to escape it without somehow being forcibly shaken awake from, uh, from their slumber. Like you said, with the instance with your family member voting for Trump or leaving the country and coming back or some instance in, in uh, regards to that. Or just suddenly feeling ostracized by my peers because I had a different opinion. Yeah. That was crazy to me that and being unfollowed by people because they did because I said something that they didn't agree with. That is very unnerving to me. Right. And they don't want to hear your they don't engage you to find out why you may have this opinion. They just simply say, well, like a cancer, I will cut you out. Exactly. And it's give me a break in the comedy scene. It's it's not you're not being there's I get up and always joke about how Trump is going two terms. And that's and (laughs) joke, joke about it. (laughs) I think it's happening. (laughs) It's totally happening. They think it's a joke. That's what's funny. And then I always am like, why are you guys laughing? It's totally not a joke. But it's this the, the 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 fact that they find it completely unbelievable after they I'm like, you thought he couldn't win and he did. And now you still think he can't win again. Like what level of insanity is that? Yep. And it's, you see, it's like, crazy to me. Oh, yeah. And you just see, you know, like you, you look at like there's certain things I, you know, I'm sure we we both uh, despise uh, about Trump and certain things we could probably say, oh, OK, well, that's that's at least uh, moving in the right direction. You know, like for me, it's a lot of the taxation and the regulation uh, or deregulation, I should say, and the economy improving and and Americans getting a little bit more uh, profit in their pockets. So I I like Mm -hmm. that. But I hate the war shit. I can't stand it. You know, like I I hate all the uh, the involvement in Syria. I hate that that he's continues to be involved in foreign entanglements. But at the same time, then I go, well, goddamn, it looks like North Korea might denuclearize. So I mean, are they ignoring this? (laughs) They all get in there and say they're against war and they want to get the military and then they get in and then it's really like the military industrial complex takes over and there's they're powerless against it, really. Well, I just, totally. I, I feel like there's you, it's one person. They can pretend they're doing all these other things, but really war is our bottom line. <laughs> well, and it takes and this is what drives me nuts too is like you see the anti-war people standing up and it's like it's only who's on their team. It goes yeah. like this bubble concept. It's who's on their team. While Obama was in there just laying waste to people, bl- I mean, blowing I the shit out. And there nobody's saying a peep. And then Trump gets in there and still we're not hearing much about it. It's all about this Stormy Daniels. I don't give a goddamn about Stormy yeah. Daniels. I mean, hey, look Bang as many porn stars as you want. I don't care. What I care about is you blowing people up in Syria or you uh, or you drone yeah. bombing people or, or Americans having presence all throughout Africa. You know, it's like, I, that's what I care about. I like, yeah, I, I always say whenever any, I don't know, just talk to the 600,000 dead Syrians right. and about Obama. Why don't we ask them what they think? <laughs> Ask yeah, ask Gaddafi's uh, asshole uh, how how he feels about things. Not to defend Gaddafi, but um, so- yeah, I was really just. I mean, honestly, I was just trying to survive. Like yeah. I was waitressing and trying to survive, and politics weren't my thing. And then suddenly, it became everything, and mm-hmm. you couldn't avoid it. And it's in everything now. It became politics seeped into every conversation. And tell it suddenly every ad, everything became political. And, you know, my job is in the media. You can't I can only avoid that for so long as much as I would have liked to. Yeah. Well, you know, what? it's interesting because I think politics, you know, so many often, right, we find with friend groups, we find with almost anybody talking shit is like if you have nothing else to say. You revert to talking shit, right? Whether it's about a friend, a mutual acquaintance, or just some random guy. Like, look at that guy's old ass Reebok pump sneakers from 1980s. They're pristine. Doesn't this dickhead have a life? What an asshole. And everybody has a good laugh. Now, 
instead of doing that now, people, they get bored or they don't know what to say to their friends and there's an awkward moment. And what they immediately default to is we got a reality star in office, so I'm going to revert to talking shit about the president. So mm-hmm. it's almost like a reflex. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but we're talking about like the you know how it's worked its way into everything. And that then has multiplied because of the influence of entertainment industry. I mean, of course, you know, we both live here. It's unbelievably left throughout virtually all media and entertainment. So, yeah, it's like you it's inescapable. And especially when I find like when I'm watching TV or something like that and you've just got a program where you're trying to just watch it and, and chill out. And it's just like there are, you know, this, the messaging in there is so unbelievably one sided. It drives me yeah. nuts, you know. I mean, that was one. Of, did, did you had I, we, we could talk for days about this. Do you feel like you have to censor yourself in the industry? Uh, yeah, for sure. I, mean, yeah. I, I go I when I go on stage. I will tell some jokes. I mean, you, well, you see me do my humor. I mean, I, I don't I don't pull a lot of punches, but I also don't do a lot of jokes that are specifically political. Yeah, because yeah. it's just not. I'm like, number one, uh, mo- the likelihood of me bombing is pretty high because <laughs> people are not going to like it. And number two, I've just seen how people react. with If it's any sort of Trump joke, they laugh because they agree and they don't laugh if they don't agree. So I'm like, why am I going to go and like waste my time when I'll just write shit that doesn't necessarily play into it? I'm not going to bother. Right. But if you went two hours outside of L.A. to oh, Valencia, uh, you know, if you, not even, if you went to Valencia, <laughs> yeah. you would do well. Oh, totally. No, that's totally right. Well, what do you, I mean, what about you? What do you, are you censoring yourself as well when you're doing stand up? No, no, I, I feel like I've, um, you know, I, I find that I still worry obviously because I don't, I haven't made it enough. I have nothing to lose. So yeah. Yeah. I, it's not like I have this massive career and I'm working in television and now I need to like worry. But what does worry me is you don't, you don't, it's not that I'm going to get fired, but I will see doors close. Um, well, let me ask you that. Hold on. on that though, about, I won't even know about the doors are closed. Well, that's true. But I mean, I was going to ask you, are you actually finding now that you've kind of, now that you've, that you've taken this more centrist position, more libertarian position, and you're saying you, know, you consider yourself more of a libertarian now, um, are you finding that there are doors opening to you though that were that you would never have thought of before? You know, well, like I the mean, Daily Wire and you know, yeah, it's how being, I on, ended being up on the lines of liberty. <laughs> yeah, being on your podcast, but the the it's interesting because it's just bad tactics on the left. If if you can't be critical of your movement, it is no longer a movement and it's dogma. You have yeah. to be able to take stock if you whether it's feminism, whether it's whatever your movement is, you have to be able to criticize. You have to be able to be critical of it and it has to be living and breathing and evolving. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just dogma that you're repeating over and over again and you're silencing anyone who doesn't agree with you or even worse, the mob mentality, you know. I today, Michael was like, are you comfortable talking about this or that? And I was talking to him about how the fact that we were even having that conversation about what I was comfortable saying publicly is the reason that I got Kanye, <laughs> as, as I've been calling it. Right. As I was saying to him today, I'm like, I was Kanye before Kanye, like long <laughs> before Kanye came out into in this realm. I was feeling the same way, which is you can't box in my thinking and tell me what to think. Right. It's this. It's a reaction to being told this is the approved thinking. These are the approved words. Here's the approved language that you can use. No, no. Uh. Uh-uh. Well, that's, that's not the way this works. Yeah, totally. And that's like what uh, with Kanye. You know, you look at the reaction to people. I mean, my God, you would have thought when he came out and posted a picture of that Make America Great hat, you would have thought he went out and drowned 17 (laughs) babies in front of people. I love him so much. I I have to say, I love it. It is an image for the ages. That is my favorite. I was I could not tear myself away from the Internet that day. It was I just felt bad for anyone who wasn't on Twitter. Well, did you see the, the, the like the conversation between him and John Legend that he posted too? Yeah, of course. Oh, my God. Oh, it's brilliant. It's just... I just so basically for those of you who haven't seen it, Kanye posts the Make America Great hat and John Legend texts him, which I thought actually was a uh, and, and Kanye shared it. So it was Kanye who shared this this text. But I thought it was a class even by John Legend to not try to flame him up online directly, but text him. But again, what he texted him was like, 
brother, you have a big fan base and you need to cool it down. You know, you're just, you're, you're, you know, I don't think you should be doing this. And he's like, and Connie's basically like, you're trying to use your fans against me to, to, uh, wall in my thought or something like that. And paraphrasing. Oh, yeah. He was saying using <laughs> so my great. fan base and my, my artistic power or whatever, or my, um, my legacy against me is, is yeah, just a way control. to manipulate me. Yeah, exactly. I was like, damn, way to call him out, Kanye. Uh, yeah. Although I don't know if you saw it like today. Today, this will be airing tomorrow, but uh, yesterday, for time traveling, that Kanye was on TMZ. And and why, of all the outlets he went on, he's like, I got to go on TMZ to get my message out. I don't know. But he was on TMZ, and he said a lot of interesting things. But one thing that everybody's globbing on to now is that he said that there were 400 years of slavery. And he goes, and that's a – at some point, that's a choice. You see that click from today at all? Because I think you were actually on it. Yeah, you were doing Daily Wire, I think, when when it broke. Oh. So, so that came out. And now the thing to me, though, is that Kanye, you know, like the Hill didn't really grab onto that part, but he said that statement. And I was like, all right, well, that's not going to go over well. <laughs> <Number> <laughs> no. But I mean, I can I'm trying to extrapolate and say, OK, where is he coming from? Oh, is that why if slavery was a choice is trending? <laughs> yes, that is why. Yep. <laughs> In real time, Bridget's finding finding out. <laughs> oh boy! Yeah. So now, now that, by the way, does not make me like Kanye any less, um, because I think he's here's. Let me let me. Always great when white people try to figure out what black people are saying. Um, here's what I think he was saying though: was that his point of view is like he's saying, "Look, I'm trying to break free of this mental." prison that a lot of people have put themselves into and that's what he's doing with trump he's like look you can't tell me how to think i'm trying to think outside of what i've been taught with the dogma like you're talking about and so in regards to slavery he's like look 400 years of slavery if you're a slaves for that long then you're making a choice not to rebel you've accepted the oppression i believe that mm. was his point now of course dmz and runs then- a clip of that and then they a black dude that works there calling him out and kanye though to his credit Kanye, you'd think would be the biggest dickhead in the world, to his credit, listens to the guy and then walks over. He's like, hey, brother, I'm sorry I upset you. And he goes and tries to talk to the guy. But that's when the clip ends. And I'm like, I want to hear that part of the dialogue. I want to hear what they say after that. I want to hear more explanation. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I don't think there's any way I could try and interpret what Kanye is thinking at any given moment because it's like he's... He's a crazy genius, yeah, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but it's I, like, it, it I do is. think that there is something to be said for, and I, as a, as a woman, I, I feel this and I was feeling this way about, um, the whole Kevin Williamson thing where it's don't, you know, people like Jessica Valenti were online and they were saying, um, I feel bad for the women. We need to protect the women from you being in the room. No, let him be in the room and let me have a conversation with him. Yeah. Don't infantilize me and act like I'm this victim that is helpless and can't take care of myself. And that that victim mentality is something that I think is very real. It's real for women. It's real for minorities. And yep. there is a certain amount of that that you have to take responsibility for and and bust out of it's well, your own work you have to do i mean god forbid anybody do any work on themselves or, <laughs> right? or look at themselves and ask themselves why they're being so triggered and ask themselves why this or that is offending them so deeply it's like it's it's very frustrating to me right now the i, I love that concept what you just said there it's like you know people feel that it's other people's responsibility not to offend them rather than, and you make a great point rather than saying, why am I offended? Because you know, a lot of the times it is you. I mean, yeah. I've had in my interpersonal relationships where I it's had a misconception. Always and like, yeah, it's, it's always you. Yeah, you're it maybe, maybe I'm socially you. awkward, you know, like, yeah, you're people are fucked up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fix yourself. Here's the common denominator and all of the things that I've been outraged about me. <laughs> Right. And usually when I'm in like some self-righteous moral high ground, it's, it's not, it's usually I'm wrong I, or there's <laughs> something to look at. Or when somebody pushes my button, that's not to say that you can just go around pushing everyone's buttons, but there will be consequence. There will be consequences, but I have to look at my own part in those things. Mm-hmm. I, I just, you have to take responsibility for 
what what your reaction is. Right. And also you can't just use it as people we, what we're seeing so often now is weaponized outrage. You know, right. it's like and not just on a macro standpoint, not just like I'm talking about, like the left or the right using outrage as a weapon, you know, like like Michelle Wolf, you know, people are outraged. The right's using Michelle Wolf's uh, speech at the White House Correspondents Dinner, you know, as a, a weaponized outrage to attack the left. And and meanwhile, though, on a personal level, so many people we see now are like they use this this any little thing they can get on you as outreach to attack you so that your opinion doesn't matter and so they can disregard you and what you're saying. And well, that's, that's what just drives me What is that? Nuts. That's rules for radicals. That's that's the book. Yeah. It's literally the book. Yep. Well, t- by the way, so this is a this is a good time. I w- let's get into uh cuz I want to I want to hear about your your Tucker Carlson story, and then I want to take a break and come back and talk about some other things. So, tell me about your tell me about your Twitter and this Tucker Carlson shirt that you got sent and and the experience there because you wrote about this for the Federalist, which by the way, I was very interested in that party, but then they kind of got all jacked up, uh, God, they like infighting in that weird party. But, but I like in, in which party in the uh, the Federalist Party. They had a party, and and I was looking at it as a serious alternative um, because oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, not the not the publication necessarily, but yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, so so you wrote an article for the Federalist about this. So tell tell everybody and tell me about the the genesis of this Tucker Carlson experiment that you did with this T shirt. <laughs> Um, my friend had a Tucker Carlson t-shirt and I was like, where did you get that? <laughs> and I took a picture of it and then I posted it on Twitter and I was like, someone buy me this shirt and I have a PO box so people can send me, you know, angry letters or whatever. <laughs> and, um, two people bought me one and ah, nice. So you don't have to wash it that frequently. You can just alternate. Oh God. It's my favorite shirt. <laughs> And there is definitely a trickster in me. I'm a comedian. I can't, it, the, speaking of pushing buttons, my friend always said that I look at the world as like a child looks at an elevator panel. Just, <laughs> like, I want to push all these buttons. And then I'm like, why am I stopping on every floor? This is bullshit. <laughs> so well. there's there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I I'm aware that when I do these things that there will be you know, I know when I'm, when you're trolling, you're going to oh, get yeah. some blowback. Yeah. And so I, I ended up wearing it and I was, I wore it like one day and got the funniest reactions. And then I realized there was this great test of the bubble. And, uh, so then I wore it for like a week everywhere I went, I rotated them out and washed them. And, um, <laughs> so, so you say officially, that's the official narrative. I officially did. And, <laughs> Uh, it was funny. And then, uh, Ben on Twitter, Ben Dominant, she's the Federalist publisher. And he was like, we write, he, will you write about this for us? And you know how I ended up writing for the Federalist is I, I started, um, be like comfortably smug. If you want, I, I guess I'll talk about my Twitter for a minute. Yeah, yeah. I was feeling so isolated ideologically. And once I started getting Kanye, I was, I was like, I felt really alone in LA and I remember the night of the election feeling really alone. Cause I was like, eh, it's going to be fine guys. Like there'll be another election and presidents come and go and yeah. everybody was freaking out. And, and then in the aftermath, I wrote this piece. Uh, that's really when the backlash started for me actually. And it's gone off playboy now. It's so sad. Um, oh, man. it's, uh, Trump is already making America great again. Oh, okay. And that was when I lost like 600 followers. It might have been a little too soon for them. It was the inauguration. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? Oh, first to move, you know. I was still chilling for the left even at that point. I was saying, you know, this all of these things aren't bad. And by he's bringing poison to the surface. You can't really lance a boil until it comes to the surface. He's invigorated uh, i would say one of the most apathetic populations known to man good point um and i was just trying to look at the bright side and the optimism and you know even the other night i went to the the mpac awards they're they're the muslim uh they it's the muslim communities their organization that works with hollywood to kind of take control their of their narrative 
And so that was say, try to take control of Hollywood. I was like, it's the Muslims versus the Jews all over again. <laughs> <laughs> That's the funny thing, though, is is that the irony as I was sitting there listening to the speeches and they were giving the awards. And, you know, I was thinking about all the, the leftists being like the Muslim ban and so angry, especially in Hollywood and all of the all of the people in Hollywood who get so outraged. And no. it's like, gee, where did these stereotypes come from? <laughs> Why does everyone in the Midwest think that all Muslims are terrorists? <laughs> I wonder where they ever could have gotten that idea. Maybe all the pop culture and movies that they've seen in the past oh, totally. and, 20 years. Well, that's, you know, actually, you know, I don't want to interrupt your story, but I actually I was going to see if we want to talk about Hank Azaria and the whole Apu thing, too, today. But we'll see how the time goes. So anyway, too. That's it's nuts. It's all nuts. I I, I could tell you a million stories. So um, that you just reminded me of that. <laughs> my, my friend is getting uh, his master's in psychology and they have to read all these articles and discuss them. And they're all like social justice warrior oh, approved. Of course. of course. Oh, it's terrifying what they're teaching in colleges. I had no idea. It explains so much to me why this y- younger generation is the way they are. It's literally what they're being taught. But one of the things he got sent was this ableism article. And it was the the final paragraph of the article was all discussing whether or not douchebag was an ableist term. Well, I don't even know what ableist term means. I'm trying ableism. to figure out what the hell that. Oh, do you know what ableism is? No. What is? Tell me about ableism. Oh, God. You, I can't believe you don't know about ableism. I this don't know. Thing. It's it's um. it's not Cain it's, and Abel, it's, right? It's, Where you got to kill your brother because that I'm all for. It's it's language. It's the systematic institutional devaluing of bodies and minds deemed deviant, abnormal, defective, subhuman, less than. And then it says ableism is violence. Ah, OK, <laughs> well, everything's violence in this day and age. That makes sense. So then there's this whole list of words like you can't use crazy. You can't use lunatic. You can't use uh, nuts, psycho words I use every day. Right. Yeah, of course. Well, retard's uh, already been stricken. We can't oh, use retard no, anymore. That's like the N word. You can't. Yeah, you can't, you can't ever say retard anymore. Um, and for me, coming from the East Coast, that's like a term of endearment. Oh, totally. So I totally. All the time and get in trouble <laughs> constantly. It would be in radio ads like, hey, you retards, come on down and get a car tomorrow. <laughs> Extra discounts. Yeah, totally. exactly. So the last paragraph says. I know a lot of people who align with feminist, womanist, and other anti oppression politics. I know a lot of people who align with feminist, womanist, and other anti oppression politics have conflicting feelings about the term douchebag and its variations <laughs> like douche canoe, douche hat, etc. That's my favorite part. <laughs> so, it gets better. Some think it's fine because vaginas can naturally clean themselves without douching. <laughs> But others think it's misogynistic in general because a douche is something women use. (laughs) And others think it's trans misogynistic specifically because trans women with constructed vaginas may need to use a douche. Are you who the fuck is thinking about that? I'm telling you, this is there. This is this is a real thing. It's I'm like, where do I go from here as a comedian? I can't write anything funnier than this. No, it's Ever. amazing. But now I know a good way to, if I, if somebody at trans is pissing me off, I'm like, why don't you go get your douche bag? Cause oh. you don't have the vaginal juices to clean yourself. And then they'll really be hurt. <laughs> <laughs> It's just ridiculous. God, so crazy. Yeah, exactly. Well, hold on, but get finished the Tucker Carlson story real quick. Oh, so I wrote about it and then everyone got all outraged and whatever. And they were yelling at me. So I, I wore, oh, I was going to say Ben on Twitter. I was, it was ages ago and I was tweeting about something, something about feminism or something. And I said, yeah, I would write this piece about how I hate being infantilized and literally nobody would publish it. (laughs) And then Ben had saw it and he was, and he found my email and he was like, we'll publish it. (laughs) <laughs> good on it man i love it yeah but that's the thing is that you essentially if you aren't on the left you're on, you're a conservative that's yeah. why 
places like the Daily Wire have me on, and that's why places like the Federalist and Libertarian um, podcasts and whatnot, because I'm just because I dare to question anything on the left, and they won't they won't publish it. Yeah. No, so I didn't leave my I didn't leave the Democratic Party. I got pushed out. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like Roseanne Barr when she was on Jimmy Kimmel. You know that she had said, "Look, I." I stayed the same. You know, I, I've essentially been here and you guys went crazy balls left. You know? Crazy balls left. <laughs> I mean, crazy. They're always huffing and puffing about, and I probably shouldn't even say this, but you know, they're always huffing and puffing about Trump gaslighting America and lying, which I'm not saying he does not do. Uh, oh, he totally, totally. Here. <laughs> And in fact, that's one of the things I love about him. Is yeah. that it's, he is a, he's trolling chief, and it's very entertaining. Chief, and they and they're saying he's eroding the quality of what's real and what's not real. And we, how are we gonna, how are we gonna be able to tell what's real and what's not real? I'm like, this is coming from the tribe of people that's telling me I can't say boys and girls are different. Right? Yeah. Then you can what be a wolf if you wanted it. Corrosive. Yeah. to reality than telling me that boys and girls are are not different and i'm not allowed to say that yeah no, crazy exactly, exactly. it's like it, the reinventing of reality and, and you know it's like to the central core of what this conversation is about is that people have we've gotten to the point where people are literally allowed and able to create their own reality and then mm -hmm. everybody says well no you can't burst that bubble you have to let them live in it. And you know what? There was a uh, music video somebody posted in our forum, the Lions of Liberty Forum. You got to plug in here, which you can find on Facebook. Just type in Lions of Liberty Forum and um, and say that you heard it about this on this podcast. Otherwise, I'm only in. But no, but it's like one of the comedians from The Whitest Kids You Know, which is a, a hilarious sketch comedy show. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. I think it was on IFC <laughs> for a lot of years. But no. I, no, oh, it's, it, it was unbelievably on PC. I mean, like the most on PC sketch comedy show, but this guy, I think it's Tyler, ah, like on his name, he had a video and it's basically just about that. Like, look, we need, he, basically the point of his music video was we need bullies again because bullies mm. are the ones that would shake people out of this idiotic reality. They've created for themselves where they say, you know, I'm a cat and I identify sexually as a cat. I'm a trans trans catist and it's like we need bullies just to uh to knock these people a little little sense of these people tell them look there's a reality we live in this reality that's right here and uh you know you can't just invent this bullshit and expect to get away with it forever and expect everybody to cater to your whims type of thing mm -hmm. it's so true so. everybody wants to just it, it's crazy I, it's 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 bananas that i was just thinking about the the Apu thing and the, um, that girl who wore the Chinese dress to prom. Oh, God. That I <laughs> oh, God. I had to turn Twitter off. It pissed me off so bad. Yeah. The cultural appropriation of wearing a Chinese dress. She's like, what, a uh, Latina girl, right? Yeah. I, what, yeah. Cultural appropriation is just such a funny thing to me. Yeah. She's like, she posted, I, and you know what? Kudos for this girl. This, I know this girl has more goddamn guts than uh, than ninety percent of the media, ninety percent of people out there. Because she was like, you know what? It's a beautiful dress. Fuck off! I don't care. Yeah. You know, yeah, good for her. good. I hope that it's she has so a long weird, and strong career. The dumb little things that we latch onto. Yeah. What? Why? Why are you tormenting a like a girl who went to prom? What? Right. How much privilege do you have? You're just sitting. I can see these people are just sitting in their miserable lives just torturing this poor pretty young girl with her whole life in front of her oh, yeah, and it's like the vultures they're constantly circling and then they're, they're like so ah. angry i think i was reading some I, someone posted something about just the bitter bitterness and the anger of the left in particular just how angry they are. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, they're just sore losers. That's all it comes down to. They cannot get over the fact that they lost. Is it sore losers or, hey, you're a sex columnist. Is it, a, is it, is it some sort of odd mental sexual gratification now that the left is drawing from, from, like, making other people feel bad about themselves? It's really weird. It is a bizarre – it's – that mob mentality and the way they all circle the wagons to protect the one – you know, their most – their recent hero and then they'll cut you out if they like they'll eat their own in two seconds oh, and yeah. abandon you they don't care if jimmy kimmel said the wrong thing 
Although he gets a weird pass because he was on the man man show and yeah. it's like, how are you guys just <laughs> overlooking the decade or whatever that he was like the biggest misogynist ever? It's funny. And it's like, and, and meanwhile, I love the man show. I still think it's very funny. And I still think Adam Carolla is very funny. And it's like, it's one of those things where God, I really need to take a commercial break so we can talk about this. You know what? Hold on. We're going to come back. Okay. We're gonna take a break. And we're going to come back with more Bridget Fantasy here on Lions of Liberty. We'll be back in just a minute, guys. My name is Dale Kearns, and I'm running for United States Senate in Pennsylvania as a libertarian. I'm a concerned citizen who has had enough. I work as a project manager for an electrical contractor in southeastern Pennsylvania. There I manage large commercial and industrial projects. I'm a husband and a father of two energetic little girls. I'm running to advocate for a society where my girls have more liberty, not less. Will you support our campaign? Unlike my competitors, I'm not a career politician. I don't have millionaire and billionaire donors. I'm running for Senate in Pennsylvania because I want to take the message to Washington that we want government out of our lives. Will you let me be your voice? Let me be the voice that says we will not walk quietly down the road to serfdom. The voice that says we need free market solutions. The voice that says we need to end the failed war on drugs. The voice who will fight for the forgotten man, non-violent offenders wasting away in prison, and addicts who are afraid to speak up and seek the help they need. We are seeking members for our campaign team. I encourage you to apply. We need donations to help us spread the message of liberty across the state. We can go on hoping for liberty to happen, or we can fight together. I hope you choose the latter and join me today. Find out more at DaleKearns.com. Paid for by Dale Kearns for Office. All right, we are back with Bridget Fetessy, comedian, playboy, sex columnist, writer for The Federalist, and Mel. She's a wonderful woman, and I have her here with me, and I'm very happy to uh, <laughs> to have her tuning in, or tuning in, commenting. <laughs> I've been so all over the place. I apologize to your listeners for no, being. You're, you're it's, great. It's such a relief to be able to speak freely. I'm just <laughs> like, here's everything I think. I love it. Well, don't worry. Like, you don't have to applaud to these people. They hear me doing that same thing, but uh, far less coherently than you've been. So don't worry. <laughs> but no, so, so we left off talking about uh, the, we left off talking about Jimmy Kimmel and how Jimmy Kimmel's become this uh, you know the the less speakerphone for many issues and people really looked at him as like the leader and in, in, in the movement and forget his past as the man show host along with Adam Carolla. But, you know, it's like even th- taking that to account, it's one of those things where you go, okay, you know, th- there's nothing intrinsically bad about humor that is aimed at one portion of the populace. And, and I don't know about your, you know, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts on the man show were, because while you could say, was it sexist? Yes. I was an extra on the man show. It was my first job in LA. Yes. <laughs> How were they to work with? Um, honestly, Jimmy was pretty cool. Adam was kind of, he, Adam was definitely the more misogynist of the two. Oh, really? <laughs> I do remember Jimmy being like, uh, he was participant, but he seemed like a reluctant person. You know, You're he didn't right, yeah. seem like he, he wasn't like as into it. He was as just Adam there for was. the money. <laughs> yeah. He was, he was just up and coming. I think it was just a gig, you know, you yeah. know how it is in this industry. You're I'll like, totally. sure. I'll, I'll play a slave, whatever. Like it's a gig. Right, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, yeah my friend, my friend is a, you know, he's, he's his entire reel, even though he rages against the, the, Muslim stereotypes. He's like, I still have to work, and he ends up playing a terrorist with an accent <laughs> every all the time single movie, yeah. and hates himself for it. But still, is like, well, I got to work, and so you're put in these positions, and especially early in your career when you don't have a choice. Yeah, and um, so I, he seemed, and he was really nice. He actually was very nice, and Adam was okay. Yeah, he's decent uh, enough. Yeah, well, you know, it, it will. Enough. Here is the question, and this ties in because we had talked about the Apu thing with Hank Azaria and how Hank Azaria is now saying, I wish I had never done the voice and I'm a horrible person. You know, it's, Is it's, that what he's saying? Yeah, he, he literally is like, he's like, I wish I had never done it. And Shut the fuck up. This yeah. is like Molly Ringwald saying Exactly. She, like, what are it. you talking about? You can't judge the present. It's called context. Right. You can't judge the past based on the present. That's like when somebody talks about about something, anything. I mean, even just like tearing down all the statues. I'm like, oh, you know who else does that? Isa. Exactly. And it's like, and people talking about tearing down, like, hey, we should we shouldn't respect George Washington because he had slaves. It's like, well, you know what? Everybody had slaves then. Everybody yeah. had slaves. You should it's respect. I mean, I- context <laughs> that it's like, oh, that's 
um, what is it like, uh, the, what is the word I'm looking for? Like, but not white privilege, but it's the intellectual privilege. No, it's it's just like that. You can't, those terms didn't even exist. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's well, it's, all, it's like the 1984 style of we, we're going to go back and we're going to uh, we're going to tear these things down and then we're going to rewrite history to pretend that they never happened. It's like, well, they happened for a reason. And that, that context is how we got where we are. You know, it's like America had slavery, the shortest time of any nation in I the know. world to that point of any. Of and them. we're the, the the nation that decided to give it up willingly right exactly i mean we fought a war over it yeah. but, <laughs> well we did but fight a war but but you know a lot of people died it but it's like people you know it's the context of it and you go well you know and and it's the same thing that you're talking about with a poo with with uh uh breakfast club and and the other thing that too and this is what i want to make the, it, it will and also are we going to pretend that the characters that judd nelson's character and molly ringwald's characters don't exist in life because they do I know them. I, I personally knew people growing up that are exactly like those fucking characters to a T. So what? We, they don't, we're supposed to pretend they don't exist? I just hate all the apologizing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I did this. I'm sorry I played a poo. Right. I'm sorry that I'm white. I'm sorry that it, it's like, no, n- no, no, stop. Exactly. That's not helpful. Well, what also, is that accomplishing anyway? Right. And, and how do you learn? Right. If everybody's sorry all the time and nobody's willing to voice their opinions, how do you They're learn? They're not anything? sorry. There's, it's like the the apology is a virtue signal. They're not actually sorry. Yeah. It's easy to say, "Oh, I'm so sorry that I was this For, forty million star later star." <laughs> now that I have all this money in my bank account, why don't you fucking yeah. say you're sorry and then give back? Okay, give back all the money that you made being a poo. <laughs> exactly. If you're so fucking sorry, <laughs> if you're so sorry, donate all the money that you made from. All of the Breakfast Club movies and the John Hughes movies to charity of your choice. He could Asian, literally, whatever. He could literally take that Apu money. How fitting would this be? He could go and make like forty Slumdog Millionaires. It's it's such Literal. bullshit. <laughs> I mean, that kind of disingenuous, self-flagellating crap, so that they can virtue signal makes me fucking sick. Well, not only that, it, but it's like he's also it's so it's a character, right? A poo, you could argue, okay, is it is it a stereotype? Yes. But what do they do with the stereotype? And, and also you could say, well, you know, stereotypes also, for better or worse, do exist for a reason. I'm not just Yeah, they them, but, don't exist. I was a waitress for twenty years. Right. My entire job was basically like, don't be racist. Like ninety <laughs> percent of it. And then ten percent was like waiting tables. But it was like <laughs> Don't stereotype these people. Don't assume these white ladies are going to be out. Nope, they're awful. Yeah, they're awful. yeah exactly. Like, the stereotypes exist for a reason. And what the Simpsons did with the poo is while he was like, thank you, come again. And, you know, he's like, I regret saying that. You know, and, and all the, you know, these Indian cultures saying, well, it's, you know, a negative stereotype. They also portrayed what was a stereotype that exists, whether people want to acknowledge it or not. They showed a lot of different sides to a poo. They showed him as uh, having a heart, having the, all these different aspects to him which if you have what is considered primarily a negative stereotype and then you are adding depth and nuance to the character and showing people a different way of looking at that character or those peoples isn't that a good thing yeah yeah you yeah. would think you would think it's, al- it's also <laughs> called satire right <laughs> like what what are you gonna satire if there's no what satire is based on stereotypes that's what you make fun of you, you poke could, fun of them to point them out you use stereotypes in satire to break through those the stigmas and to highlight those areas that that we might take for granted or our blind spots that's what satire is I, it's oh. like it's really infuriating. And I get so fired up about this. Stuff. Well, <laughs> like, as you should. And like in comedy, you know, like look at all the comics that are being shut down. Uh, I mean, Owen Benjamin is an example, but uh, many yeah, comics but now. Let's give me a break. I mean, Owen is. Uh, he's out there. Well, Owen's out there and he's unapologetic. But but the point being, I had though, a very weird interaction with him and it was online and it was with my friend and then he verbally basically abused the two of us 
And then people reported him for it because she has a big following and was like, what the fuck? And they were just observing him, like, lose it on us for literally no reason. Uh. And then he got banned for a week and he said it was because he was conservative. And I was like, bullshit. It's because you called my friend a cunt. And yeah, but there's a lot. But that's the thing, things. though. But that's see, I don't think that's fair to just to say that it's because of that, because people do that all the time on both sides. So and it's like, I don't know. if I mean, necessarily, I can't say for sure why they did it, but I don't want to. And, and like, and I've had Owen on the show before. And you know, a lot of our a lot of people listeners like Owen a lot. But, you know, he's he like I said, he is completely un hindered by by uh by tact or uh or or worry of anyone's feelings i will say that so i have no doubt that he definitely attacked uh your friend in, in uh in very descriptive terms but i would also say though but you see that from like people on the left do that constantly and they don't get banned from twitter though yeah you know and like make death threats and they don't get banned from twitter yeah i mean it's i don't know it's that i i don't know they like free speech doesn't isn't consequenceless well no so i agree completely i have an issue with people who hide behind this free speech thing that that suddenly that means you get to say whatever you want or behave however you want and i like owen but he's verbally abusive. Yeah, yeah, and I would, and I would agree with you there. <laughs> and I don't think that's okay. I, you, yeah. if you walked into McDonald's and did that, you get kicked out. That's capitalism. That's that is free speech. You can say whatever you want. It doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer consequences for that. I agree, and, and I agree. I was actually I was having a, an interesting conversation. Well, you know, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds in this on this because I just talked about it with my last guest. But but the the point I guess I was trying to make though in uh, incurring the name of of Benjamin and uh, and talking about this is like you know we talk about satire and you need to be able to to make fun of things and how yeah. in in general culture has turned on that so hard where it's like you can't make fun of things you can't make fun of certain people or certain topics and it's like and if you try. You are now ostracized, and, and like you said, you no one will publish your article. Yeah, you know, no one would. No one will book a lot of comedians, or or comedians are self censoring, and they won't go to play college campuses because they know those kids will turn on them, and they won't laugh, and they'll get them banned. You know, it's like so that that is just heartbreaking to me because comedy at the heart of it is is needed. You know, it's what's supposed to be doing is poking holes and and making fun of what you're not supposed to be able to address in proper conversation. And if you can't do that, then we're, we're stuck in our bubbles again. Do you think that that is a result of the culture being satirical? Like the fact that we're living in a South Park episode? Do you think that it's somebody said to me once on Twitter, they're like, there's a reason nobody in satire is laughing. It's hmm. because and it's, I, I it, cause the world is so satirical. It, it, we are living in an onion headline. Do you think that the reaction to that is to is to is to be hyper serious i don't know i mean it, perhaps people think that that's the way to to answer the problem or that's the solution to the problem is that we need to crack down more because look at the way things are going but it's but they don't realize that they're making that problem worse it's like a it's like a um a re well the rebound effect of all of this push to okay we've got to make things better by cracking down you know crack it on free speech and on this and on thought it's rebounded in Trump. You know, it's a, a this mm. this push for the for the left and this push for all the programs and the push to to become a more European society. And I mean, it has resulted in Trump. And look like look at the UK. They put that they well they find that comic for teaching a fucking pug to give a Nazi salute. Right. You know. I mean, like, I would. That's the UK though. I would. Are, they but that's have what people laws. want for us. Like that's what they they look to like the UK and they look to Sweden and all these places as like we we need to be more like them. And I'm like, look, we fucking beat their asses in a war to not be like them. Like wasn't mm. that the point? <laughs> but I would argue or think in you my argue. Instance, <laughs> it's not even argue. I would just I would say that from my perspective and. Not to invoke Owen again. I there's the reactionary. <laughs> it's like of coming down from above, like the appearing. In, in, like appearing. Yeah, it's like it's appears like out of the clouds. Calling me a con. It's I'm raining. Like, oh, it's God raining damn, in LA. There he is again. <laughs> um, I I would say, and what's funny is that he unfollowed me. I was like, snowflake. Oh. I never followed him. <laughs> 
Who's a snowflake now? Although, I don't know. That might have been, he got kicked off Twitter for good. So maybe he just got kicked no, off. No, no, this was a while ago. Oh, it was before. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no, he definitely, he was mad. Um, <laughs> because in a lot of ways, if you dare question his authority, it's very similar. So so my my whole point is that that's one way to go is extreme reaction. Get red pilled, get go. I think that Trump is absolutely a pendulum swing to a lot of the left yeah. ideals. Yeah. But then there's what I see is people like you and me and more and more people who are rea- who aren't necessarily reacting by becoming radicalized. Yeah. We're hopefully going in the other way, which is to kind of de-radicalize. I'm trying to just constantly take in all perspectives and hear everybody out and see things from all different sides and be more reasonable instead of allowing myself to go down this extremist rabbit hole and on either well, side. Let me ask you this, because this is a question that I have my own theories as to how best way to accomplish it, but how do you get people to try to think more like you? It's a stumper. <laughs> I, don't, I don't necessarily want people to think more. Well, no, no, I, I don't mean think like you and like specifically, but think like you as far as your view on, I want to hear different viewpoints. You know, I, I welcome feedback and I want to know your point <laughs> yeah, of view. I don't know. I, I don't know that that I, I'm in an interesting position because I'm an alcoholic who is in recovery, which means I don't have the luxury of letting myself get too upset. I, and I'm grateful for that in this, in this political climate, I don't have the luxury of uh, becoming radicalized because that is dangerous for me. That leads to me using heroin. So in order for me to stay sober, I have to kind of stay centered. Mm -hmm. There needs to be, I'm constantly looking for balance. Extremes for me are just bad. I know that I can't. So I don't know, like, (laughs) <laughs> maybe no, no, we, Bridget, I know what you're saying. I hear you maybe, loud and clear. Maybe we need, we to, need to start a 12-step program. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to say we need to get everybody addicted to heroin and then bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we need to start a 12-step program for people who are like extremists on either <laughs> political spectrum. I think you just figured out your next article. Oh, are the 12 steps of political activism yeah, the, t- the 12 steps the 12 steps uh to bring yourself like, back from the edge of political extremism yeah the 12, the 12 step program. steps of sjw's yes <laughs> i <laughs> like it I mean, that's probably a good place to wrap it i think what do you think i think so we've covered a lot of ground we have we have well guys uh, i want to remind you well, actually here bridget give give everybody i mentioned the top of the show but give them a breakdown where can they find you where can they read you where can they support you so uh, you've got your patreon as well patreon is fun um you can find me at bridget fetasy a b r i d g e t p h e t a s y i live on twitter i'm on all the socials but i really only use twitter um it is my homeland it is what made me it's probably what will break me <laughs> oh, i'm sure it's a fickle mistress and look i love owen so if you're one of owen's unbearables don't come <laughs> at me <laughs> That's I, I love that. I love the guy. Yeah, I respect all... his. I respect his like his freedom of thought and his Kanye. You know, I, Owen too. He was Kanye way before Kanye. Oh, big time, big time. Now, like I said, I, I we we both love Owen. But if it, you know, if you love Owen and you know of Owen, you know how Owen can be. And that's yeah, uh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> and that's not, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Uh, so yeah, man, you guys got to check check Bridget out. Oh, check out Mel Magazine. They're great. They do some cool stuff. And, and, and speaking of, I have linked. Playboy so- recently um, switched over, so I don't think I don't think my old columns have migrated but i also have a theory that they're like erasing me from there yeah well <laughs> you know, the the playboy <laughs> column now is behind the paywall so you can't access that those those sneaky bastards i think they're trying to make me disappear though between you and me and all of you oh, those sons of bitches because of my politics <laughs> if that's so then that's horseshit because who you know people these are just people sh- who love boobs and should want to get different viewpoints from people that have boobs Tough. It's tricky out there for me. Oh, seriously. Tricky. Yeah, because I was going to link to it. Well, I did link to your your recent Mel uh, Magazine article, which unfortunately, guys, 
I'm going to talk a little bit more with Bridget uh, for our patrons. You can join our Lions, uh, Lions Pride program. I'm going to talk to her about a recent article about how you were once uh, in a sex cult for a month in Australia. And, oh, that is so savvy of you. <laughs> suckers. Sign up for his Patreon. Yep, yep. got to get on there, guys. So you just go to lionsofliberty.com forward slash support. Otherwise, make sure, guys, listen to Mark Clear on Mondays. Make sure you listen to me Wednesdays, John Odermatt on Fridays with Felony Friday. And uh, otherwise, from me, Brian McWilliams, from my friend Bridget Fettesy here, from Electric Liberty Land, and from Lions of Liberty. <laughs> Always stay plugged into Liberty. Kind of fucked that up at the end, but I'm just going to leave it. Because that's how I roll. Right, Bridget? <laughs> that's how you roll. <laughs> All right, nice. guys. Thanks for listening.